So, um, so we are uh, so so blessed to have Brother James Nadori here. He's going to come and give a testimony. Amen. Habari enu. Say habari enu. Say my hello. How are you doing? <laughs> uh, it is a great pleasure to be with you uh, this evening. Thank you, Pastor Robert Palot and the church for giving me this opportunity to give my testimony. Uh, I come from Kenya. My name is Brother James uh, Ndori. I have married a beautiful uh, wife named by Phoebe. I call her sweetheart. <laughs> and she, she calls me baby. <laughs> because any man who has over 60 years is like a baby. <laughs> so she wa he wants somebody to care for him. <laughs> uh, we have been married for 39 years years. This year, we celebrated our anniversary for that nine years separately. He, he uh, herself in Kenya, me here in Mission, February. So when I go back, I'm supposed to get many flowers. <laughs> so I will take one week to celebrate together for that nine years. God has given us six children, one son, and five daughters. But the first son, Cyrus, is that seven years. La the youngest, Seraphine, is 22 years. So they are all full grown up. But Sarah, we stayed with her in our church. We she play piano in our church. Mm. I'm uh, pastoring a church where I have been pastoring for 28 years, Kabati Bible Baptist Church. I'm also a grandpa of nine grandchildren. Wow. It was early 1978, two of my friends invited me to a fundamental Bible, uh, be, uh, Baptist preaching church. Before that, I was going to a religious where you can go sing, jump, cry, without knowing that you are going to hell. But two of my friends, when they invited me, the pastor preached from the book of John, chapter 14, verse 6. And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and life. Nobody can come to my father but by, but by me. The pastor preached three points. Jesus is only the way to he heaven. His own life to heaven, his own the truth to heaven. So there's no other way you can go to heaven without Jesus Christ. Amen. After an invitation, I came forward, and the Holy Spirit convicted my heart, and I was shown scriptures from the Bible, Romans Road, and accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Amen. Since that time, Jesus changed my life, mm -hmm. and I became active in the church after receiving immersion baptism. I was continue under the discipleship of my pastor for uh, three years, being active in uh, Sunday school ministry, youth ministry, solo winning ministry, and other responsibility pastor gave unto me until 1981 when I surrendered my life to serve my Lord in the ministry. I joined the Bible College in 1981 and graduated in 1983 in, Bi uh, in, uh, in Bible theology. Since then, I have been serving my Lord in Kenya in different uh, places. It was not an easy task because I was raised by my stepfather. My stepfather wishes was that to care for uh, when a, 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 a young 
man has grown up must find a job so I must care for them and my other siblings. So here was ministry, money, ministry, money. But I surrendered my life to serve my Lord Jesus Christ. So when God calls you, heed to his voice, do not hesitate because he wants to use us in his ministry. I also, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pastor, I'm, I have studied other three churches. The one I'm in and other three churches. churches. I've trained men who are taking care of these churches. I also have Bible Institute with 10 men, young men, which I train those who are willing to surrender their life to Jesus Christ. This man, we give them transport going and coming, and we give them meals four days per, per month. I also reach to the youth with the gospel of Jesus Christ, because in Kenya, we have a population of over 50 million people, and we speak 43 languages. So about 15 million young youth who have graduated and went to college and university are jobless. If you give them a dollar and you say, stone that cars, the vehicles, they will stone it. Why? Because they want something to put in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, on the table. So the way we can change them is to reach them with true, pure gospel of Jesus Christ. Then I help mothers who are helpless, widows who have uh, no job and no uh, husband. We give them some little thing to eat once per, per, uh, once per, per month. In addition to that, my wife is dealing with Sunday school children. Uh, these children come from different background. Some can come without not eating or drinking. We give them tea or uh, soda or biscuit or piece of bread. So through these children, we reach their parents with the gospel of Jesus uh, Christ. So that is what I'm doing in my country. As I said before, being in the ministry or being a pastor or a missionary is not an easy job. It needs much of sacrifice, commitment, and prayer. I was married in 1983 to Phoebe, and the day we married, uh, the second day in, 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 uh, in order to go to honeymoon, we went to somebody's sugar cane to work for him so we can put something to the table. I had a church where I ministered before, the one I am in, uh, and my, uh, my second son get sick and we could not have anything to bring, to, to send him to the hospital. The only medicine we could afford was herbal medicine. So we give him until he died. So we were shocked because we were young and nobody can, was near to comfort us. So I take a leave of one month to go back home to comfort my wife and to rest. I left a man to care for the church. When I was away, he convinced the church and become the pastor. He told the church, I'm not able because I'm away. I've left them, so they take him. When I came back, when I saw, I say, this is the God's work. We are not able to fight. So you continue, me, I'm going back home. But after one year, God called me the place I am serving now for 28 years. Amen. So uh, let us be committed and serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for me, pray for my ministry, because in Matthew chapter 9, verse 38, Jesus said, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. So let us pray for the Lord of the harvest to send his laborers 
world wide. And my desire, my future, I have done over than 40 years in Kenya, as I say, serving, but I have done nothing. Because my Lord Jesus Christ, your Lord Jesus Christ has not come back. So until why he has not come back, we must continue serving, serving him. So my desire comes from Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Paul said, brethren, my desire and my prayer is, is my people, Israel, to get saved. So we must cry for our people. I am still crying to my community and my people Kenya to get saved. Even not in Kenya, even here in America, we are supposed to cry for our friends to get saved. We are supposed to cry for our family to get saved. We are supposed to cry for our neighbors to get saved. So God is using us as his vessel to fulfill his work because he's coming with his reward to pay everyone according to his work. God give only Jesus Christ. I have six children, but I cannot give to die, one to die for somebody. But God had only one, Jesus Christ, forgotten son, and he, he gave him to die for your sin and my sin. Jesus Christ give his blood he pain, he feel pain on the cross. It was, could be, be you and me to go to the cross because we are sinners, but Christ pay our debt. Yes. Somebody did to you somewhere and to me right. was the gospel right. of Jesus Christ. Right. So it will cost us to reach only one soul, one soul to get saved. It will cost us our time going to the station inviting them to church, giving trucks, ETC. It will cost us our talent, teaching, uh, preaching, and doing work in the church. It will cost us our treasurers. The Bible say, how can be a preacher without being sent? Right. So they must be sent. So that is the heart of mission. So then you for giving me this opportunity. Many is on the, on the by paper. You can read by yourself because of time. We need to hear the word of God. Thank you for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. We have enjoyed the atmosphere of US, uh, USA, a uh, nice meal, a delicious meal. When I come, the clothes I come with, I have thrown away. This one I got here because my body has expanded because of the nice meal. So then you, ladies, then you, uh, churches. In addition to that, I have enjoyed snow. I have not seen snow since I was born 63 years. So I have seen snow eye to eyes. Another thing, I have been shown how to eat ice cream. <laughs> I, did <not laughs> I did not know how to eat ice cream. So. I'm still enjoying your country. May God bless you. May God bless Pastor and help ministry for giving us this opportunity to come here to share our testimony. Thank you very much. Wow, you know, the um, missions, we talk about the heart of the gospel. You know, we, it's what missions is. Uh, from here to there is missions from there to here. And here you've got uh, a man from Kenya challenging us to weep for our neighbors. Amen. Hey, I thought I was supposed to give you money to go do it. No, he came, <laughs> he came over here to tell us to get it done. Amen. Amen. So I appreciate that challenge, uh, Brother Dory. Uh, what a blessing. Uh, well, we do have, uh, after the service, we'll be downstairs. Everyone's invited for a meal. Hope you get a chance to uh, stop by and talk to the gentleman a little bit more. You guys, of course, are invited to stick around, but uh, it'd be great to take a, a prayer card, uh, uh, Brother James's prayer card, grab, uh, grab that and his testimony there and spend some time chatting with him. But uh, so we've, I've asked Brother Knickerbocker to come and, and close us out tonight and, uh, what, what a, uh, and, and explain a little bit in the beginning the vision of Helps Ministries. It's really similar to where Brother Josh is at 
uh, with his, uh, in his philosophy, what you're doing right now. Um, and that is uh, connecting with national pastors and uh, uh, just being a blessing administratively to them. So by the time you come. Thank you so much, Pastor. We are thrilled to be here tonight and um, appreciate what's been said already and uh, appreciate Brother Dory. Get to get to, got to know him the last last month or so. Okay. All right. I'll probably just stay right here. You never know, though. You don't know. Some, sometimes God gets into it and you have to start running. I don't know. <coughs> I'm not a runner and screamer, but, uh, you know, uh, but uh, we appreciate that. Our, our help ministry started about 30 years ago in, in Tampa, Florida, with uh, Dr. Scotty Drake, and he had gone, he was pastoring there and, and had gone down to Metamoros, Mexico to see one of his national pastors um, down there and see what he was doing and working for the Lord, and he found that these uh, national pastors in Metamoros were reaching the Aztec Indians who were coming down out of the mountains to work in the factories there. They were meeting them and, and winning them to Christ, and then training them and sending them back up to start churches. And by the time he got up there he, to see what was going on up in the mountains, they'd start something like 44 Baptist churches all through those mountains with those Aztec Indians. And, and nobody else was reaching them. Nobody had a heart for them. And he, he came back, just stirred up, and said, we got to do something for these nationals and help them to do the work. Now, we don't, we don't do the work for them. We just help speed them on their way to do the work. Amen? They've got the, they got the language. They've got the culture. They're not going anywhere. Nobody can send them home because they are home. And, um, and so they just continue on with the, the Word of God. And so we, we help them in a lot of different ways, provide Bibles, training materials, libraries, um, and uh, transportation even. And um, a couple of our National pastors from Kenya just recently were uh, were given motorcycles, and the money was raised here, two thousand dollars for a motorcycle, and our brother is recipient of one. He's been walking everywhere, or public transportation doesn't even have a bicycle, and now he's got a mot he's going to have a motorcycle when he gets back and buy one. He's got the money for that now, and we're excited about that because he can move all over the place now and get a lot done. But pray for him. He doesn't have a driver's license. He's got to learn how to ride a motorcycle all by himself. So it may be rough for a while. I don't know. But uh, we we'll have to really pray for him. Amen. <laughs> and uh, so, but that's, that's the kind of thing we do. We try to help them speed them on their way. We had one guy from, from Kenya last year was here and said he needed a motorcycle. He's been pedaling his bicycle 10 miles through the jungle to teach in a Bible institute. And uh, he says, boy, if I had a motorcycle, I could go in two different directions. Well, I talked to him in January. We were over there in Kenya in January, and I, I talked to the same fella. I said, how's it going? He says, well, he says, I got this motorcycle, man. It just flies through the jungle, man. I can go. And he says, I've got that Bible Institute there, and I started another one, another area. So he's got, he's got seven fellas over here and ten fellas over here. He's just doubled what he can do. And he's got, he's got um, ambitious goals. I mean, he wants to start 100 churches before he dies. And he's already up to 30 or 40 already. And, um, but that's the kind of thing, you know, they're multiplying the work. And it's, um, it's great. And so supporting a national pastor like this for 30 or $40 a month is, is a tremendous a blessing and a good investment and helps a church of any size have a global impact. And you can, you can have a global impact. You, you can send people where you can't go, amen, where I can't go. And uh, I want to just, um, just clarify something he was saying because I know he said a lot of things that's hard to understand everything. But here's how they, they read their Bible Institute like this. They'll have one week out of the month that they'll uh, train the, the national pastors. So they'll come and they pay, they pay the, 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 the uh, students to come, give them transport for on their buses or whatever, uh, to the college and then back home again. In some cases, they'll give them a little stipend, stipend as well to help the families because the families have gone without the worker for that, that family for a week. And uh, then they'll, they'll intensive training for that one week. They'll give them uh, a, lot of, a lot of homework 
send them back home for three weeks. They'll work in, through that. And they're also working in ministries. Many of them are starting churches at the same time. So they come back to the college every week, every month, with a lot of questions, I'm sure. What do I do in this situation? So by the end of three years, they not only have a, a, a theological education, but they also have a hands-on experience. And so that's where a lot of his support goes, not for himself necessarily, but to, to help these other national pastors. And then once they start a church, they always look back to Mama Church for help. Amen? And, uh, and so you, you kind of keep shelling out. It's like having family, <laughs> like having five or ten kids, you know. You always uh, six kids, you're still shelling, you shell out for them, amen? And you do that. And so if you have any other questions, I talked to Brother Nidori afterwards. He'll be out, be able to answer any questions you have about his ministry, what he's doing. And uh, he asked me about health ministries, what we're doing. And did I cover that okay, Brother? There's a lot more that can be said, but <clears throat> I'd like to say something about what Jesus did, Amen. Let's take our Bibles and turn to John chapter 6. John chapter number 6. <clears throat> We're going to start in verse 5 and read uh, through verse 15. A very well-known story concerning the feeding of the 5,000. But the question I want to ask you is, how can we reach the 8 billion people in the world today? Over 8 billion. I can't even understand what... That means, actually. I've never seen eight billion of anything. Have you? No, not even pennies. <laughs> but and I like what you're doing here with the, the, uh, the jar. I mean, that's just this morning? You've been putting it out there. That's wonderful. I want to challenge you with something, okay? And that's, that's a great, great thing right there. There's a, a church in, in uh, where are we, New York? Yeah, there was a church in Bath, New York. Forget where I, we were in Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont, and just, just recently. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out where I am in Buffalo. Okay, um, there's a church in Bath, New York, near Corning, New York. And the pastor's granddaughter was challenged by an older man in another church. He said, "If you take a two-liter bottle and fill it with dimes, it'll add up to about five hundred dollars." He says, "Why don't you fill one up?" This, this, this year for the missionaries for next year. Well, this, this girl really latched onto this. And um, she, just, she just bugged everybody for dimes every week, you know. She just focused on it. And, um, and she filled it up. And the next, next year, they presented to the national pastors this bottle. It's, it's heavy. Let me tell you, it's heavy. Well, this last year, they did two bottles. And um, some of that went to pay for his motorcycle. Another went to help pay for a printer and a copier that our brother from the Philippines you'll hear tomorrow night that he got. And he really needed that for his Bible Institute as well. But um, it, was, it was amazing. Then they're up in, we were in, in, in New Hampshire. And there's uh, four brothers that are there, just like stair steps. And for the last number of years, they've been selling rocks. Now, New Hampshire has a lot of rocks, okay? <laughs> the White Mountains, right? And they've been selling rocks to the people in the church and raising money for the missionaries. And then when the missionaries come, they, they come up at, at the end of the service and missionaries stand up there and they give them the cash of money that they, they raised for that year. I think this year it was about $45. And um, that was just really, really neat. Uh, but I'm saying we can do things if we want. We can give if we want to. Amen? And, and have fun doing it. I don't know about you. I love serving God. It's so much fun. I can hardly stand it sometimes, you know? It just, I just say, God, you've been so good to me, allowing me to be in the ministry and, and serve you in this way. So how can we reach the 8 billion? John chapter 6, verse 5. Let's all stand. We've been sitting for a while, and you know I've learned over the years that the brain can only take in what the seat can endure. Amen? Amen. And so I don't want to lose anybody to S-L-E-E-P tonight. All right. Uh, verse 5 of chapter 6 of John. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company come unto him. He saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? This he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, not that every one of them may even take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But... 
What are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in the number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled the twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would take him in by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Father, thank you for your, your matchless word. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much for the blessings you've poured upon us in so many ways. We pray that you bless, Lord, the message now to stir our hearts, I pray, for missions like, like you, only you can do and only you, you would want to. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. The feeding of the 5,000 comes uh, on the heels of, of a very difficult thing that happened because John the Baptist had just been beheaded before this happened. And, uh, and Paul and, and Jesus and his disciples were, were hurting. I mean, you know, as far as the flesh is concerned, John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, and um, his second cousin anyhow. And he was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He says, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. And he, he just kept uh, pointing people to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, he's the one you need to know. But you know how it came about that he was beheaded for his faith. And, uh, and upon hearing that, Jesus said, let's, let's, get, let's get out of here. Let's, let's get alone by ourselves. And so he took his disciples and they got off by themselves, but the crowd found out where he was. And they caught up to him. The Bible says when Jesus came out, he looked on the multitudes and he was filled with compassion for them. And he felt, he felt that their, their need was there. And, and, um, and so he started ministering to them, even though he was tired, even though he was hurting. And, uh, and you know, sometimes that's the way it goes in our lives. We can't always choose how we are going to serve or when we're going to serve. And uh, preachers know this very well, that you serve when you're tired a lot of times. And you talk to people and you, maybe Sunday night's over and you're wiped out and you're tired and, and somebody's got to talk to you and, oh, pastor, I've got to tell you this and that. And sometimes we get weary, amen? amen. But we, the, work, the work of God must go on. And there'll be time to rest later on, amen? amen. Some are going to rest in heaven. <laughs> Uh, my wife said years ago, she says, I'm so tired all the time. Probably when we had five kids at home or something. Oh, that'll do it to you. So as long as we get to heaven, I want to I want to have a big king-size bed. I want to sleep about a thousand years. Just start, st start it off just like that. Amen? How many feel that way sometimes? You just, whew, I get to heaven. I'm just going to sleep for a while. Amen? Trouble is, honey, trouble is we're going to have a brand new body. We're going to feel like lifting all over heaven. Amen? And I don't know what we're going to do up there, but I'm sure it's going to be better than we can imagine. So Jesus took his disciples by ship to a desert place outside the city of Bethsaida in Luke 9.10, Luke 9.10, for the purpose of getting some rest. The multitudes learned where Jesus was and followed them to this location. And Jesus and his disciples were so busy they didn't even have enough time to eat. Now, that doesn't happen to Baptists most of the time. Amen? We, uh, our brother, our brother Dodori here, he came skinny. He was so skinny, you know. He stuck his tongue out, it looked like a zipper. You know, he was so skinny. He had to wear skis in the shower so he wouldn't go down the drain. He was so skinny. But he's taking care of that now, and he had to buy a new suit because he's expanded his waistline. Amen? God has been blessed him. And uh, his wife's going to go home, and she won't recognize him for a couple days. And uh, so that's going to be a blessing. Amen? Um, but the time to feed the multitudes and reach the lost is not always convenient, is it? It's not always convenient to serve God. We're often tired. We're hungry. We're busy. And that was the case of Jesus and his disciples here. They were tired. They were wore out. They were busy. 
They were hungry. They wanted something to eat. They wanted the multitude to go away. Get rid of this multitude, Jesus. We, we came from here to rest. We've done nothing but work. And so Jesus, is. this is a teaching time for his disciples because he knew that in the future there would be situations just like that. Only he wouldn't be around to help them. They're going to be wore out. They're going to be persecuted. They'll be killed for their faith. They'll suffer for Jesus like he did. And they need to learn to just keep on keeping on even though they don't feel like it sometimes. And you folks, you don't feel like going soul winning, just go soul winning. Doesn't matter. God will give you the energy that you didn't know you had. Amen. You don't feel like going to church, just go to church anyhow. Hey, you know what? You can sit in church as well as sit at home. Nobody's asking you to do anything except if you're the ladies group and they said such a wonderful job tonight, didn't they? That was beautiful music. Oh. You don't hear a lot of music like that much anymore, preacher. Let me tell you, it's wonderful to hear good quality music that lifts up Jesus. And they said about worshiping the Lord about 50 times that song. You ever notice that? You notice that? That was, that was tremendous, wasn't it? Let's look at that. We see the situation. Let's look at the need here. Jesus has been teaching the multitudes for the whole day. Now it's late in the day. People were hungry. It's a desert place. There's no access to fi find, buy food. There's no Walmart nearby. There's no Kroger's. There's no, no restaurants. They do have Kroger's up here, right? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to talk about words that, okay, no tops. No tops up there. Tops. We got tops. Okay. I knew I'd land on something. Uh, down south, it's different. We got Wind dixie and, you know, different things like that. Yeah. That's a good southern name, isn't it, Winn-Dixie? I, I laughed when I first heard that when I went to Florida. I said, that is the strangest name for a grocery store, Winn-Dixie. <laughs> anyway, now I'm used to it. But um, there's nothing, no, there's, the, the need is great. It's almost an impossible situation. And let me tell you something. Sometimes God gets really a lot of glory by us going through impossible situations that we have no answer to. And he just, he builds this for his disciples. He sets it all up to make it just as impossible as is possible. <laughs> now let's look at this impossibility. Disciples sought to send the, the multitude away so they get something to eat. They said, you know, if we get rid of this multitude, we can sneak into town. We know Judas Iscariot's holding the money over here. We know he's got a little extra cash, and, and we can run into Burger King and McDonald's and get something real quick, you know, and then get in and get out, you know, and all that kind of thing. But, um, but Jesus sent the multitude away so they could eat. And Jesus said to them, give ye, give ye them to eat. You feed them. It's like God saying, I want you to reach the entire world, all 8 billion people. Uh. That's an impossibility, isn't it? It is. Unless God gets in it, you can't do anything. I don't know about you, but I get overwhelmed sometimes of the need around the world. I talk to our national pastors, and they tell me how many, you have 43 languages in your country, and there's more than that. There's over 100 languages in the Philippines. We had one Filipino that told a story about he was in Manila, the capital city, he lived there, and he moved 100 miles south to start a church in the Philippines, same, same country. His kids came home from school crying. They says, what's the matter, sweetheart? And he says, yeah, are, the, are the teachers mean to you? No. Are the kids mean to you? No. What's the problem? We can't understand our teacher. She speaks a different language. Same country. Now, if you folks went to Georgia, you might have the same problem. You know, I'm just saying. Just saying. If they came up here, they might have a problem. Amen? But, um, but I'm, I'm just telling you, that there's, there's, a, there's challenges that in the ministry, no question about it. And Jesus says, give you them to eat. Now, there's 5,000 men besides women and children. And he said to Philip, uh, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Jesus said that. Where are we going to find bread that these may eat? He's, he's, he's setting them up. He's saying, I'm going to ask you a question. You don't have any clue what the answer is. And this he said to prove him. We know why he asked it. 
He didn't ask it because he didn't know the answer. He already knew what he was going to do. But he wanted to prove him. And God is always proving us sometimes. He pushes us to the limit sometimes. We say, I can't take any more. And God says, did you know I'm on board with you? Did you know you can do all things through Christ which take strength with you? Do you know you cannot do anything without me? Without me, you can do nothing. Have you forgotten that? Yes, we forget that every day, don't we? Oh, I can't. I just can't go on, Lord. For he himself, what will you do? And Philip answered him, okay, I'm going to give you an example, God. 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may eat just a little bit. That's the impossibility. Under that, understand that, Jesus? <laughs> and Jesus is probably laughing inside of him. I'm, I'm sure he laughed a lot inside. Amen with these guys. One of the disciples, Andrew Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, here's another guy. Here's a lad here. Uh, we've been scrounging around trying to find some food here. And this guy's got, this little boy's got five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Philip says, we've got money, but it's not enough for even everybody to eat a little bit. We've got food, but it's not enough for any, everybody to eat. This is an impossible, no money, no food. Little money, little food. Gigantic group of people that we have to feed. And so Jesus said, okay, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, the men sat down, a number about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. Verse 12, when they were what? Did you ever see that before? When they were filled, right? Hold it. 5,000 men filled. Have you ever seen a man eat? Downstairs, you're going to see some men to eat. <laughs> they can put it away, amen? Some of us can. Can you imagine feeding 5,000 just like that? I mean, I don't know how, how much food we get downstairs, but you ladies, you usually knock the top off it with having plenty of food. Praise the Lord for that, amen? And it, when, he, when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments, remain that nothing be lost. Now he said, make the men sit down by fifties in a company on the green grass. Now, there's 5,000 men. He made them sit in companies of 50. If you divide 50 into 5,000, five you get what? 100. So there are 100 groups of 50 sitting in the grass. That's a lot of people. 100 groups of 50 men. That's not counting women and children. Now, You've got 12 disciples. So each disciple gets about eight groups of 50 to feed. Those guys are busy, let me tell you. That's interesting, isn't it, huh? <clears throat> I don't know where they got the baskets. I don't know where they got all this stuff. But Jesus could just create that like he did the food. Amen? Amen. And it's amazing. I, I, I don't think they ever forgot this. Well, they did because later on they, they, they said, oh, what are we going to eat? And Jesus said, you forget about the feeding of the 5,000. <laughs> how, how quick we are to forget, aren't we? Oh, yeah. We are. But I can't imagine watching Jesus take there and breaking that. All he had, all he was doing is just breaking bread and fish. And it's filling baskets. It just keeps flowing out of him. You know why? Because Jesus is the bread of life. Amen. Amen. Yeah. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth in me shall never thirst. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. And, uh, and, and Jesus is, uh, is the answer to everybody's need. God often creates an impossible situation that only he can meet. God already knows what he's going to do. He has a solution. Every problem has a solution. Amen? And don't forget that because he... He has, he's got it all worked out. And, you know, he was in the future before you were. He sees the past, the present, and the future all at one time. We live in the present. All we see is the past. That's why we get discouraged so quickly. Amen? We forget the blessings that God did for us. We forget the answers to prayer that he gave. We forget how he came through for us in a tight spot. We forget all that, and we just start complaining. 
We don't have enough, Lord. We can't do this. <laughs> he said, you were there two years ago. What's, what's the problem? Well, who are you trusting here? But he already sees the future. He already knows he's going to do. I'm glad for that, aren't you? I'm glad that God is already in my future, looking out for me already, answering my prayer before it even needs to be answered, taking care of me. Thank God for that. The miracle here, the solution. And he set them down, and he broke the bread and blessed the food. He, he blessed the food. Those five little loaves and two fishes and that. Don't you suppose that little boy is still watching his little lunch there? His mom had packed that for him. And he said, I'm going to go see Jesus. I hear he's nearby. I see the crowd going. I want to. And she said, well, Sonny boy, you better take some, some food with you because you might get hungry along the way. And she packed a little five little loaves. These are not gigantic loaves, okay? They're probably little loaves like this that you just walk around and nibble on and a couple of dried fish there that he could just, you know, chip off and eat and so forth. He goes along. But Jesus breaks these loaves and fish into bite-sized pieces for everybody to eat. And then he gave the food to the disciples and he gave the disciples to the multitude. And the people all ate and were filled. There were 12 baskets left over let me give you a couple thoughts here. He gave the food to the disciples. Now, God has given us, I'm going to reach 8 million people. God gives the food to us. You say, yeah, I know, I can tell you, preacher, you eat a lot. And that's not what I'm talking about. He gives us the word of God. Amen. The word of God is that which satisfies the hungry soul. When you were lost, do you remember when you were lost? You were looking for something. You are trying everything. Tomorrow night you'll hear the testimony of my brother from the Philippines, Brother, brother uh, Jewel Magbagba. He's gonna, he'll tell you a bit about his, his testimony that he was raised in a Catholic home and he was, they, were, they were trying to get him to be a Catholic priest. Not his parents, but the Catholic church was. <laughs> and he'll talk a little bit about that. Until he was faced with the gospel by three young people who came knocking on his door on Sunday afternoon. And you know, he, said, he tells about how spiritual he was and how religious he was and, and how he was the leader of the youth group. And, and, uh, and, they, and he was telling us a little bit more. I hadn't heard this before. He says, we used to carry a, an idol of Mary around with us door to door and just bless people with the idol of Mary. So he did all these things, but he was lacking something. When they asked him, do you know for sure if you died, you'd go to heaven? Well, he's trusting his good works. Nobody who ever trusts their good works ever knows for sure if they're going to heaven. You know why? Nobody ever thinks they've done enough. I've talked to a number of Jehovah's Witnesses through the years, but I've never met one, not one Jehovah's Witness, who ever thought they were one of the 144,000 that are going to heaven. And I say, why don't you think you're one of the 144,000 that's going to heaven? Because they believe only 144,000 is going to heaven. That's not true, by the way, okay? Yeah, I correct false doctrine here as I teach it here, okay? <laughs> they don't believe that at all. They, they, because they don't think they've done enough. Well, someone's done more field service than me. The more people have knocked more doors than I have. There are people who are more faithful to the church than I am. And I just, I, I just probably won't qualify. I just don't know. But I, I just probably don't think I'll make it. I'll have, to, I'll have to surrender my thought to just inheriting the earth. That's the two choices they have, by the way. It's made up by the devil, isn't it? Listen, God has given us the food that this world needs that satisfies the longing soul and brings people to Christ and gives them a, a peace they never had before and gives them a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, listen, I can tell some of you are saved. It's written all over your face. Amen. Oh, I, 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 love, I love being around Christian people. They're just the best people on earth. I don't care if they have a bunch of troubles. They're still the best people on earth. Amen? Amen. You've hung around the lost people long enough. You know that. He gives the food to his disciples. Then he gives the disciples to the multitude. So God has given us the word of God, and then he gives us to the multitude. I want to I want to show you a thought here in Acts chapter 14. I usually preach this, but I'm not preaching it tonight. But I'm going to touch on it just for a second. Acts 14:27. I want you to see a, a very important.
principle here. The last verse, next to the last verse of chapter 14 of Acts, Acts 14, 27, when they were come, this is Paul and Barnabas coming back to Antioch to report to the church their missionary endeavors, uh, their first missionary journey. When they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Who gets the glory there? God does. He says, I want to tell you what God did with us. He didn't say, I want to tell you what I did for God. There is a difference. And it's easy for us preachers to fall into the trap. Well, I pastored this church for so many years, and I won this many people to the Lord, and I did this, and I... No, you didn't. God did it with you. In other words, we got to put ourselves in the hand of God like a tool you would use and let God use us and put us in, a, in his hand. And, and every time I get to preach, I, I pray a little prayer. I say, Lord, I, I put myself into your hand. Use me as you will. Amen? And, I, you, know, you know, I just want God to get the glory. The disciples gave the food to the multitude. God says, pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Hey, listen, newsflash, it's not my harvest. It's his harvest. I don't know who belongs in a harvest, but God does. He says, you want more laborers? He didn't say, get the preacher up here and just red hot message on missions and get people down the altar and surrender to missions. That's not what he said. That may happen. He says, if you want missionaries, you pray. Matthew 8, Matthew 9, 38. Amen? Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers in his harvest. Listen, I look at young people in churches and I say, boy, there's some sharp looking young people here. Man, nice dressed, probably educated, maybe even got a little money. You know, God really can use them. And God says, yeah, that's what you see. I see the heart. You have this, this young person who just doesn't fit in with everybody else. You know, they're not the big man on campus, or the big lady on campus. And, they, and, and everybody just bypasses them when they want to do something. And, and they feel pretty much alone, but they have a heart for God. And God says, that's the one I want to serve me right there. And it'll surprise the entire church as to who goes to the mission field and who doesn't go to the mission field. Give yourself to God. Say, God, I put myself into your hands. Use me as a tool to reach the lost, however you want to do it. I've got the word of God. I've got the answer. I've got the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all they need. Lord, help me to take it and use it for your glory and for your honor. Put me in your hand and use me. That's what Paul was saying there. Disciples gave the food to the multitude. You notice Jesus didn't, didn't hand give to anybody except the disciples. He says, you disciples, you are the dispensers of the bread. Amen. Now, Jesus provided salvation. He provided, he is the bread of life. But we got to take the bread to the people, and if we don't take it to them, they're not going to get it. God has no other plan. He didn't say, I'm going to, if you don't, if you guys fail to get the gospel to the world, I'm going to have to break down and use the angels. I have to write it in the sky. Now, if I were God, which I'm not, you ought to be glad I'm not, but if I were God, I'd write the gospel on every leaf of every tree. I'd write it, I'd sky write it in the sky. The plan of salvation. Nobody has an excuse now, do they, huh? That's not the method God used. You see, because that would be supernatural, too supernatural, and you know, God wouldn't get all our glory out of that, really. You know what God gets glory out of? Using people like you and me. We're weak, we're sickly, we're, we're up and down, back and forth, we're hot one day, we're cold the next, and God says, I get a lot of glory using you. Amen? Woo! I, I just, I want to be used of God. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Sometimes I've got tracks in my pocket, sometimes I forget to put tracks in my pocket. That's called being a humanoid. Amen? We are forgetful. And I, 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 I berate myself when I do that. I say, Tom, you're just not concerned about souls. That's your problem. Whoa! I preached to myself worse than anybody else has ever preached to me. Preachers, you do too, don't you? 
We do, man. We just knock ourselves all over the place and wrap our heads against the proverbial walls and say, what's wrong with you anyhow? Don't you care about souls? Why don't you have tracks in your pocket? And then I'll put tracks in my pocket and I'll forget to give them out. Now that's stupid as well, isn't it? I say, what an idiot. That person needed the gospel and, and, and I didn't even give him a tract. I should have, but I didn't, you know. I've given these out. These are fun. I gave this one to a lady sitting, on the, sitting outside the motel today. And she's out there smoking and so forth. And, and I said, ma'am, I want to give you a smile. It tells you how much God loves you and cares for you. Oh, thank you. We are on our way into the, mo into the restaurant today, and this lady comes, and she's got piercings all over her nose and lips and stuff. And I, I said, well, I need to give her. So I said, can I give you a smile? I'll give you a bunch of smiles. How about that? This is from the church over there. And she says, this is such a blessing. She says, I'm having a terrible day. Everything's going wrong. She was almost in tears. You don't know who, who needs the gospel, do you? Right. And I said, well, God loves you. He cares about you. And you know, you can't give it to the wrong person. Don't you love it given to Christians? You give a gospel tract to a Christian. These Christians are backslidden as can be, you know. But you give one to you, oh, I'm already saved. I says, well, good. Praise the Lord. Give it to somebody else. Oh, no, no. I, I'm already saved. You give it to somebody else. I feel like slapping those people. Amen? <laughs> they're just they're bunch of backslidden Baptists is what they are, if they're Baptists at all. Anyway, but uh, just give, give it out. Amen? Give out the word of God. The Word of God is the food that people need. If God gave us the Word, we are to, He has no other plan. You are to give it out. Right. And notice the people all ate and were filled. God's Word satisfies the hungry soul. Oh, listen, people who come to Jesus, they find what they need, and they, they're thankful for what they get. And then there were leftovers. I, so I've heard preacher, pe preachers preach on this, and you know, and it's all conjecture. Some of them preach it like they really know what they're talking about, but they really don't. But that's okay. God knows the truth. What happened to the 12 baskets of bread left over, huh? Oh, I've heard it preached every way you can think of. Oh, they took them all, put them on their heads, and walked back with the boy to the mother's house, and this is what's left over, this is for you. Oh, they gave it to 12 different people that had needs or whatever. I don't know. God did not want to throw away the crumbs. He was not a waster. Right. Amen? Right. We're at a restaurant today, and it says buffet. All you can eat, don't waste food. That was another place that says all you can eat, not all you can waste. Well, you see people throw a lot of food away, needlessly. So I tell our guys when we go into a place to eat like that, I say, listen, guys, eat all you want, but you better eat all you take. And we've had them come back with some big plates full of stuff for the third time, you know. I said, let me tell you something. You've got to eat all that. You know that, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And they'll eat it all, man. They're going to roll out of that place. They weren't used to that. <laughs> but there's always enough. Listen, what's the 12 baskets tell us? There's enough. There's still enough for more. There's still enough to feed some more. Amen. The word of God, you can't get rid of it. It's, it's, you, can't, you can't use it up. You, you give it away, there's more. You give it away, there's more. You give it away, there's more and more and more for everybody. No one has a, 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 a will stand before God and say, God, I'm telling you, you are not right. You did not get, have enough bread for me. I starved to death spiritually because you didn't have enough bread for me. They'll never charge God with that one. Amen. So how do we reach the 8 billion people? Let me just give you four quick thoughts. Number one, follow Jesus. That's what the disciples did. Follow Jesus. Be where the opportunities are. The opportunities are everywhere, folks. Some of you are going, how many are going shopping tomorrow? It's Monday. How many go shopping on Monday? How many do your laundry somewhere besides your house? Nobody goes shopping. Nobody does laundry. Okay. Um, how many are going to Walmart tomorrow? Come on, all the hands going up. Whether you need to or not, you know, you're going. Be where the opportunities are. Opportunities are everywhere. You can't, you can't, every time you step out of the house, there's opportunities. Prepare yourself. Take, take with you some bread. Take the bread with you, amen? And you are the basket, and the bread is the word of God. It's follow Jesus. Number two, see the need. See the need. Look at people. 
When you look at someone, ask yourself this question. Are they going to heaven or are they going to hell? That'll move you to do something. Amen? Someone said this, look at people, look at the lost with flames of fire going around their bodies as if they're in hell already. Wow, that'll move us. Amen? So we need the bread of life. Listen, our job is to get them the bread. God's job, the Holy Spirit, is to convict them of their sin and bring them to Christ. And so you can't do wrong by, by sowing the seed. Some sow, some water, God gives the increase, right? Now, everybody likes to pick fruit. But do you know how long it takes to grow fruit? Do you know how long it takes to prepare the ground for fruit? And then to get rid of the weeds and water it and take care of it and watch it grow and grow and grow. It takes months. How long does it take to pick the fruit? Just like that. Not hard. You can do it in one day. You go through your garden and pick all the tomatoes in one day, can't you? Everybody would make heroes out of all the people who are picking fruit. <laughs> what about the people who, who gave that person the gospel years ago? Someone who lived a righteous life in front of them. One thing happened um, a number of years ago. We got a call from a young lady. She's now a mother and um, with children herself. And she said, I live, remember I lived next to you in Dunkirk, New York. I said, yeah, you're the Catholic, it was the Catholic family that lived next to us. We tried witnessing to them, he didn't want to hear. Well, the, one of the daughters ended up in Texas, I believe, and she got saved, and she was faithfully attending an independent Baptist church there. And she says, I just wanted to call you and tell you that you guys lived such a life in front of us that it just made me want to be a Christian. We didn't know that for years. And we thought, oh, it's wasted. We were nice to these people. We tried to share Jesus with them. But we just stayed faithful, serving God. We were in church every Sunday. You know, some of you folks, if you skip church, your neighbors are saying, hey, their car's still there. It's church time. Why is their car still there? This car shouldn't be there. Oh, it's there Wednesday night too. They'll usually go on Wednesday night. Why is it still there? We are preaching a message every time we serve God or don't serve God. Amen? Amen. Be faithful. Be faithful to God. Follow Jesus. See the need. Give him what you have. Give him what you have. You say, I don't have anything. Give yourself. Give yourself to Jesus. It's like the little boy who didn't have anything to give to Jesus or at the, at the missions conference didn't have anything to give to Jesus. He said, I don't have money. I don't have, I don't have a lot of ability. I'm just a kid. What can I do for God? Then he got the idea, and when they were taking up offering, they put the offering there, and he came up, took the offering plate, put it on the floor, and he stepped into the offering plate and said, Jesus, I just give you me. I'll give you me. That's all I have. That is all God wants. That's all he wants. If he has you, he has everything you have. And last of all, let God use you. Let him use you. Give what you have been given. You've been given the bread of the gospel. Give what you've been given. I just want to challenge you tonight <laughs> to say, Lord, I don't know what you have for me. I don't know what you want to do with me. But Lord, I just want to surrender myself. I don't have to know everything today. But I want you to know one thing about me, Lord. I'm willing to go to anybody you send me to. I'm willing to be a testimony. I'm willing to take the bread to the lost, to the 8 billion people. And God's not asking you to go all over to Africa or to the Philippines. He's asking you to go to your neighbors. Who's going to reach your neighbors if you don't? He's going to reach the people in Kenya, Africa. Other brothers are going to reach the people in the Philippines and all around the world. We have people all over, the, all over the place. Well, he's got us here. And then say, God, what can I do for missions worldwide? How can I give some money for missions this year? And, and ask God to challenge you with that. And see what he'll do. See if he won't bless you and use you in a great way. I want to encourage you to come at the invitation here. We're going to pray and then ask the pianist to come and play something, if you would. And preacher, I will turn it over to you at that point, and I'll pray. Let's all stand together, shall we? As the pianist starts playing, I just